Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sarando Sucero Ye Olahuri Samyao Sanpatoshi Namo Sarando Sucero Ye Olahuri Samyao Sanpatoshi Usham Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chien Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma Subtle and Profound rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good afternoon to you, good evening to you. Today is Sunday, June the 6th, Saturday, June the 5th in California, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, we're on Sunday the 6th. We're here to look into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Da Huang Guang Fu Hua Yanjing, this chapter called the 10 Stages Chapter, the Shi Di Pi. And <coughs> to get us started, let's bring up, not that, we don't want to bring that picture up at the moment. That's a picture from another event. Close that, and we will bring up this. There we are. That's what we're looking for. We were celebrating the uh, gift by the Japanese government of 1.2 million doses of COVID. 19 vaccine to Taiwan and thinking that 10 years ago at the Berkeley Monastery, we had a concert uh, along with Siji, uh, Siji Gong Dehui. We co hosted it at a concert for the Japanese tsunami, uh, which, you know, launched <laughs> so many, it, it, the cascading effect of atomic power plants and all that happened. So we uh, had created an opportunity for folks to support. And I remember the Taiwanese government donated billions of dollars to Japan in relief. So Japan has now reciprocated. And I've seen so many testimonies of gratitude to the Japanese government for for that act of kindness. So that's what we had up on, we were remembering the event 10 years ago. Here's our text. This is an invocation. We're inviting the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near. 
to bless us, wherever us may be around the planet. So if you'd like to join your palms, uh, that would be appropriate. If that feels good to you, here we go. Namo da fang guan po of a 90-year-old Gibson Mandola leading our invocation. We're going back to page 88. And today we have something very special. It's page 94. That should be it right there. This is one of those moments uh, when the sutra, we say, we, we step out of the flow of a sacred text and enter the flow of folklore, of uh, mythology is, is a word much misunderstood. Uh, mythology is often meant to mean false, you know, a made up story or just a myth, meaning not real. That's not this. This folklore mythology in the sense of the oldest stories by which we identify ourselves and know what our tribe is about. And in this case, it's the human tribe. It's not just Buddhas and Buddhists, right? So it's one of those times. And uh, uh, let me give you the context again. That is to say, we're in the 10th out of 10 stages. We're at the very top of the ladder on the Bodhisattva path. Bodhisattva path consists of 52 stages. And the going from the top down, there's one called Miaojue, wondrous enlightenment. There's one called Dengjue, equal enlightenment. And then there the next 10 going down are the 10 stages. We're at number 10 of those. So we are the, uh, we're one step away from Buddhahood in the, uh, our instructions, our theoretical progress of an individual on his or her quest for uh, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the highest enlightenment, the maximum expression of the human mind. That's where we are. Furthermore, we've finished the text part, the prose part of that set of instructions, we're now on the verses which reiterate, which repeat the instructions from the text part and uh, compress it into uh, verse form with a meter. Um, and what that allows us as people who are investigating this text, that allows us to review and to kind of uh, remind ourselves of the highlights of the, the, uh, the prose part. And this is one of those highlights. This is 
We're at the tenth. Last week, if people recall, our last our last investigation was about the excellent Dharma master, the Da Fasher, the great Dharma master. Well, great, yeah, the awesome Dharma master, the spectacular Dharma master, who what he investigated, she investigated Dharani. Dharani is this uh, Tololi in Chinese. Dharani is the ability to communicate, only communicate at a level uh, science is, hasn't, yet, hasn't yet discovered, right? The uh, hypothetical little vignette skit, the little play that the, the, the chapter gave us to illustrate what the Bodhisattva can do when he, she gets this Dharani skill. It said there might be an, uh, a vast, vast number of living beings, people and others who have questions. And it mentioned that they are particularly difficult questions, challenges to, uh, to Dharma, to knowledge, right? And all at once, they ask their questions simultaneously. And you can imagine what that would sound like, right? And it said the Bodhisattva in a single thought of his mind, meaning not with anything particularly extra, uh, no, con no particular concentration required, the Bodhisattva can receive each of those questions, particularly difficult challenges. And in a single sound, his response comes forth and replies to all of the questions and answers their doubts, furthermore, makes them happy in his response, right? So can you imagine how, how tough that is, especially we who, you know, we've got a teenager at home <laughs> over the breakfast table, getting the teenager to respond in anything other than, a, how was school? Fine. How'd it go? It's good. What'd you learn? A lot, right? We can't, we can't communicate to our teenagers. The Bodhisattva is able to not only respond to all these living beings, but also answer their questions. Furthermore, he makes them happy. And this is not some outer extraterrestrial alien quality. This is built into our own minds, this ability to do so. So we carry with us at all times, the potential latent, right? Not developed, but the latent potential to be able to completely uh, communicate to not only human beings, but all beings of the 10 Dharma realms. So amazing, amazing. Thank you, Flower Garland Sutra. Sometimes you are far out. <laughs> Mostly you are far out, but we have to like create new categories in our minds to be even to appreciate what the Sutra is saying about human potential right? Talk about the human potential movement. Well, this is human potential uh, that verges with science fiction and fantasy and wonder, right? And yet it is not anything in, it is not fictional. It's absolutely uh, at the end of the path, what someone who has developed his or her mind progressively, step by step, holding the precepts, practicing stillness and samadhi and then developing wisdom can do all right so we're going to go into it uh it's right in front of us here on the on the screen following that um going to uh present some poetry today some poem poems as they say in scotland poems some poetry on uh harmless plant-based eating. Don't go away. We're going from the sublime to the very mundane, uh, but I think it'll be worth it, and I hope, uh, hope you'll stick with me for that. Let's look into our text today. What have we got? Starting right here. Big enough. Sam, can you see on the screen? Big enough? Okay. A little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. Too small. I've got to grab. There we go. There we go. Hold up. Yes. Oh, wow. Look how big. Actually, if I make it 
wider, we can make it bigger. There we are. Hey, hey, ready. Uh, let's see, you know what? I forgot. We're in verses. I'm going to do it again with a melody. Oh, you were wishing I'd leave that part out. Okay, here we go. Sidi Shoshing Chi Chung Shan. Sidi Shoshing Chi Chung Shan. Niger Jodi Chi Fu Hui. Niger Jodi Chi Fu Hui. Chang Chiu Chu Fu Sui Shang Hua. Chang Chiu Chu Fu Sui Shang Hua. The Yes, indeed. Here we go. Through successive cultivation, he gathers good deeds. Through successive cultivation, he gathers good deeds. Collecting the blessings and wisdom of the ninth stage. Collecting the blessings and wisdom of the ninth stage, always seeking the supreme dharma of the Buddhas, always seeking the supreme dharma of the Buddhas, the water of Buddha's knowledge announce the crown of his head, anoints, the water of Buddha's knowledge announce the crown of his head. Okay, there it is, right there, the last couple words. We're in the 10th stage. What, as the ninth stage was the sublime Dharma master who, who uh, understood living beings dense thickets and was able to wield Dharani, this one, if you recall, the 10th stage is called the Dharma cloud, the cloud of Dharma. What the Bodhisattva does here is he gets what's called appointed to the position, we had a hard time translating. He gets promoted to the rank. He gets, I think military, you know, promoted from Lieutenant Colonel to Bird Colonel, Bird Colonel to what's next, Ben? General, what, lower levels of general and then gather stars. First star, second star. Different ranks. Different ranks, different militaries, yeah. So, this is a promotion and it's called uh, appointing, uh, getting appointed to the rank, stage, status, position, office, like that. Those are the words. And what it means is you become a, what's called a prince of Dharma because the next stage is Buddha, right? And this is the real top, this is the peak. This is Phi Beta Kappa, Summa Cum Laude, uh, Mensa, you know, in terms of scholastic achievement. So through successive cultivation, through all the stages, he gathers good deeds. And on the ninth stage, he's there as answering living beings questions with Dharma. And he, he himself, even though he's almost ready to graduate, he is still seeking the supreme Dharma of the Buddhas. And at this point, he goes through a ceremony. If you recall, taking a step back, when he went from the seventh to the eighth stage, he gained what was called, I'll use the pronoun he, but the feminine pronoun works fine because this, this is a gender free accomplishment. You recall he um, <clears throat> gained that stage called irreversibility, non-retreat. Right, Butuichuan, Abhivartika in Sanskrit, Abhibajir in Chinese. So it's the place from which you don't, you never, your your wisdom now transcends binary duality, the realm of duality. On the sixth stage, we keep dropping back. On the sixth stage, the Bodhisattva attained this ability of knowing two kinds of wisdom: the relative wisdom where we're still bound up in dualities, language and thought, and all the limits of that consciousness. 
But after the sixth stage, the bodhisattva was fully able to both chop up knowledge, reductionism, right? Empirical schemes whereby you know the biggest through understanding all the pieces of the smallest, right? He could do that. And at the same time, he could also completely integrate all those pieces into what it's like the, the jigsaw puzzle was complete there on the table, all the pieces, every little piece was in place and you see the whole picture and you don't respond through chopping up, through seeking finer and finer distinctions. Instead, you reflect reality in what's called ultimate wisdom, paramartha satya. And the bodhisattva at that point could do both back and forth. And the, this is, that's the kind of the, the wisdom side, the, the, uh, the zhihui side, right? But the Bodhisattva and the Sutra constantly emphasizes this, constantly, constantly. He also completely embodies compassion. Now, what is the compassion? The way the Sutra described it is he doesn't leave. He doesn't leave. At this point in the seventh stage to the eighth stage, he realizes that everything he does is like a bubble, a dream, a reflection, a dewdrop, a lightning flash. You could say like a movie on a screen, right? It's like your flat panel display on the wall. Just take that flat panel display, look to the side of it, there's no picture. But over here, the story is going on. There's the drama, right? Everything in the world, the Bodhisattva knows is just like that. And he, she doesn't quit. They don't say, well, what's the point? since it's all sort of like a dream, right? They continue. In the eighth stage, that's explicit. The Buddhas come and say, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. Living beings suffering, even though illusory hurts like mad. Help them get through the pain because of your vows. Remember your vows. So in the ninth stage, last week, the Bodhisattva gets really good at explaining. This time he's at the 10th, the 10th stage. On one hand, you could say there's nothing more to learn. On the other hand, he is always seeking the supreme dharma of the Buddhas because we, we living beings, create new and creative ways to get ourselves in trouble. The Bodhisattva has to come up with new creative ways to solve those problems. He goes through this thing called Guan Ding in Chinese. Um, Anointing the crown of the head, it's called. Um, <clears throat> that's one translation of the Chinese. He is inaugurated, is another way to talk about, consecrated, right? The consecration. Now, as I introduced it, what I said was, we're kind of stepping out of the realm of a Buddhist sutra to enter the realm of folklore, uh, sacred ritual. And what I want to, let's see, we're going to go down. I'm going to go down to the bottom of this page and read one, two, let's see here. Uh, actually, no, we're not going to do that because We'll, we'll do the next, we'll do one and two. We'll do two, two verses today. Let me do the second one now. Here's the Chinese. Are we ready? Here we go. Wada wu shu zhu san mei. Wada wu shu zhu san mei. Yi shan liao zhi qi zuo ye. Yi shan liao zhi qi zuo ye, zui ho san mei ming shou zhi, zou san mei ming shou zhi, zhu guang da jing heng hu dong, zhu guang da jing heng hu dong. Nice. 
He acquires samadhis beyond numbering. He acquires samadhis beyond numbering and skillfully discerns the function of each one and skillfully discerns the function of each one. The final samadhi is called accepting the appointment. The final samadhi is called accepting the appointment. Abiding in this vast state, he rests unshakable. Abiding in this vast state, he rests unshakable. Okay. Our 10th stage has a number uh, of surprising contents, things that just pop up and you kind of go, where, where did that come from? Okay, it's part of the 10th stage. The first is this ceremony of anointing the crown. And the second is entering samadhis. And the samadhi, dharani and samadhi are two of the advanced states of a Buddha and a Bodhisattva that I, I mean, I have not done a comparative research into anything comparable in other traditions. I know in uh, Kabbalah, in uh, Jewish mysticism, there are states called Devakut, uh, which Professor Matt uh, was interested in doing and seeing whether this advanced state of transformation of the mind of consciousness is anything similar to Buddhist samadhi, the dhyanas, for example. And that that's a topic for a scholar to research. But as far as just looking at the top of the waves, um, it's hard to find any other uh, mystical, spiritual, co contemplative, meditational tradition that articulates these samadhis, dharanis, etc. These incredible states that start with a being and transform that human into a vessel for the Dharma. That's safe, right? To call it that. Fa chi, sai fa chi. Whereby knowledge is arising from within, but it connects with knowledge that has been in the world, embodied in Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and sutras for as long as humanity has been functioning, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm getting in past my, past my topic. The samadhis happen, then another one of those incredible phenomena happen, and it'll be next week, a lotus flower appears. And this lotus flower, is a special flower. It's just an extraordinary visitor from the world of botany, from the plant world. It's a plant, it's a flower, right? And yet, what is a lotus flower sends out lights and the lights circle the bodhisattva and they enter his head and allow him to, you know. And then following that, uh, we have the, uh, Explanation of wisdom that is the part of the cloud of Dharma, Fa Yun Di. That's this, this state, the stage of Buddha's wisdom. Um, after that, we have the introduction of kings of mountains, right? Kings of mountains. And so a little bit of Buddhist geography comes into the 10th stage. It's, it's an amazing chapter, piece of the Alatamsaka Sutra. And I want to explain it this way because up to the fifth stage, it's pretty easy to draw parallels between the Bodhisattva's experience as explained in the Sutra and our own experience as uh, Shurfu would say, Master Waha would say, cultivators of the way, right? Once we get past the fifth stage, once we get into the description of the 12 links of conditioned arising, it's, it's harder and harder to make the parallels between what the Bodhisattva is experiencing and our everyday 
experiences along the path because it's it's advanced it's out there right and you have to have walked that ground and smelled that air and seen the vista from that level on top nirvana mountain you know to be able to explain it once we get to the seventh eighth ninth and then now the tenth of course uh it's it's a challenge it's very hard to be able to share that nonetheless nonetheless we can appreciate it we can point to it we can file it away so that as our cultivation does progress and advance and refine when states happen we can go mm, yeah 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 i remember the sutra said something about that i would like to know more i remember i can go to the Abhatamsaka sutra in chinese and english and vietnamese in a korean and in uh, sanskrit in certain cases right japanese and research it myself I remember the monk pointed to it, said, go there to look for it. And we have commentary. We have Master Hua's commentary. We have Master Chengguan, Qingliang, Di, Qingliang, uh, Guo Shi, the national master, clear and cool. Master Chengguan, he left a commentary too. So we know where to look to find out more. Okay, so that's good. Even though it's way advanced along the Bodhisattva path, I can... I know where to go to find more, right? So we don't have to feel like it has no relevance to us or somehow it's long ago and far away or somehow so high that we can't even see the bottom of it. You know, no, don't feel that way. It's really good to know these things and to have a context for where we are in our daily meditations and practices. All right? Okay. What? I answered my question. All right? All right, Dharma Master. We need a kookaburra out there to go on cue, right? Okay, so what about this anointment, consecration of the crown of the head? Here we go. Let's see here. I want to share with you historical images. This is from Amaravati the stupa in India, and we have a wheel-turning monarch, a Chakravartin, who comes into being anointed to the crown. That's apparently they've reconstructed that there is a vessel of water uh, or, or oil or the, um, in the Catholic world, they call it chrism, C-H-R-I-S-M, which is a special mixture of oil and spices that you anoint the crown with. So that's India in a Buddhist context. Here is Tsar Nikolai II being anointed on the crown of the head by some elder in the Russian Orthodox Church. So this is a 19th century. Look at all the onlookers. Ooh, and their jewels and their tiaras and their necklaces and their medals and their furs. Watching the czar get his head anointed. All right, so that's 19th century Russia. Here is a French emperor. Make it bigger here. In the French court, here's the action happening right there. Some elder of the Catholic Church is anointing the crown of the head while the prince with his wig stands in the ermine robe and cape. There's a crown, there's a scepter here. And look at the audience. So this is a ritual for ascending from one stage to another. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is Louis 
Cairns, Louis XV at Rennes in the cathedral, who indeed is being anointed on the crown of the head. Maybe he hasn't arrived. These are the, the uh, knights of the church waiting for him. Everybody seems to be looking at us. Maybe we're late. Oh, here he is, coming in. Yes, yes. All right. So French royalty, German royalty, Russian royalty. Here is a scepter. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is a uh, goblet, a, a vase, a vessel used to hold the sacred water. Uh, this is... <coughs> can't tell you what that is. Here is a Middle Eastern vizier leaning forward to accept the spiced oil to anoint his crown. And I believe it, my studies said that it was, in this case, he is just a visitor. But there was a tradition in the Middle East that uh, if you really wanted to welcome a visitor, you dabbed a bit of oil and spice on the crown of his or her face or here on above uh, on the forehead. That was another one. So here we have, that's a, just a uh, cultural adaptation of the ceremony. This is David being anointed on the crown of the head by the priest Samuel, King David. Now, this is really clear right here, right? This is the young King David who is uh, being claimed as the ruler by putting oil on his head, while down below, a lion guards his throne. All right. What else have we got? Take a look here. This is a Jane ceremony while the giant statue of Mahavir is being anointed with milk and ghee. This is a huge, huge, huge statue. You see the people have to climb up a couple stories in order to get above his head. So here is the Jain faith practicing anointing the crown, I'm kind of making a mess too, but was their enthusiasm excuses it. There we go. And how about Egypt? Here are spirits. Here's a hawk. Here's an elephant or a snake spirit anointing the crown of a pharaoh. My goodness, look at the sacred symbols. We have ravens, we have egrets, we have onks. Right? So this is an Egyptian practice. And finally, that one will, this is a prayer book that also, let's see here, shows a young man getting anointed here from something dripping while angels or saints look down from on high. Here they're recycling the oil. So that's probably, all right. So what have we seen? We've seen around the ancient world and the pre-modern world, all the way through Europe and the Middle East, that this process of taking someone up a rank is accompanied by this mysterious spiritual ritual called anointing the crown of the head or consecration. And let me um, share a text that I found. There is, I, I was, I told this story before and I, when we went through the prose here in the 10th stage a few months back, I told the story of being invited to St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco when our friend Bishop John Wester was consecrated as the Roman Catholic Auxiliary Bishop of San Francisco. He has since gone on to become the full Bishop of 
Salt Lake City, and then on to Santa Fe, in Mexico. But I was fascinated to stand with my interfaith friends from United Religions in the gallery at St. Mary's while cardinals came to St. Mary's in San Francisco to anoint the bishop, uh, to create this new bishop from a priest who was born and bred in San Francisco, John Wester. So uh, I came upon the text that they use when the Catholics go through the process of <coughs> making a new bishop. And I wanna share that with everybody because it's just fascinating. And we can compare the Buddhist version of this. All right. These are, I, I'm halfway along and I apologize to any Catholics who uh, would prefer me to do the entirety of it instead of pick, cherry picking out, but we don't have time to, I'm just using this for comparative purposes. So, fill up thy priest, the perfection of thy ministry, and sanctify with the dew of thy heavenly ointment, this thy servant decked out in all the ornaments of the beauty. Okay, here's a instructional piece. If the consecration is performed in the Roman Curia, the apostolic subdeacon or one of the pontifical chaplains binds the head of the bishop elect. So the first thing they do with the candidate is they tie a cloth around his head with one of the longer cloths from the eighth mentioned above. The consecrator, prostrate on both knees, turns towards the altar and begins a hymn, come Holy Ghost, creator, come, and others continuing it to the end. Okay, pause, what's happening? They're invoking spiritual presence. One of them picks up a banjo and goes, Namo da fang guang fu hoi. No, it doesn't really. He sings another hymn, but they are hoping to invoke invisible spiritual presence, right? So clearly, this is a high point of Catholic ritual. This is one of the places where in Roman Catholic ritual, they appeal directly to spirits to come in and take this candidate from one position to, to the next position. At the conclusion of the first verse, the bishop rises and sits on his fold stool, it means a folding stool, before the middle of the altar, takes his mitre, his hat, his big tall triangular uh, bishop's hat or cardinal's hat, lays aside his ring and gloves, takes off any thing that he has in his hands, puts the ring on again, and receives the gremial from the ministers. A gremial is a vessel. He dips the thumb of his right hand in the holy chrism, meaning the oil or the water, and anoints the head of the bishop elect kneeling before him, making first the sign of the cross and the crown, anointing the rest of the crown, saying, may thy head be anointed and consecrated by heavenly benediction in the pontifical order. Okay, and making with his right hand the sign of the cross three times over the head, he says, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Peace be with you and with your spirit. Okay, now check. And we're going to go through this quickly because we, we don't want to lose sight of, of the Dharma counterpart. But to get a sense of how this thing that is happening to the Bodhisattva on the 10th stage is not unique to Buddhism, but shared among ancient traditions worldwide somehow, right? If several are to be consecrated, he repeats this to each separately. Having completed the anointing, the Bodhisattva cleanses his thumb somewhat with breadcrumbs. And the above mentioned hymn having been finished, he lays aside his hat, rises, and continues in the same tone as before saying, may this, O Lord, flow abundantly upon his head. May this run down upon his cheeks. May this extend unto the extremities of his whole body so that inwardly he's filled with the power of the spirit and outwardly may be clothed with that same spirit. May constant faith, pure love, sincere piety abound in him. May his feet be thy gift, by the, thy gift be beautiful for announcing the glad tidings of peace, for announcing the glad tidings of your good things. Grant to him, O Lord, the ministry of reconciliation in word and in deed, in the power of signs and of wonders. 
Let his speech and his preaching be not in the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the showing of the spirit and of power. Give to him, O Lord, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, so he may make use of, not boast of, the power with which thou bestowest unto edification, that you give to him, in other words, not unto destruction. Whatever he shall bind upon earth, let it be bound likewise in heaven. Whatsoever he shall loose in the earth, may it likewise be loosed in heaven. Whose sins he shall retain, let them be retained. And do thou remit the sins of whomever he shall remit. Let him who shall curse him, himself be accursed. And let who shall bless him be filled with blessings. Let him be the faithful and prudent service whom thou dost set, O Lord, over your household, so that he may give them food in due season, prove himself a perfect man. May he be untiring in his solicitude, fervent in spirit. May he detest pride and cherish humility and truth. Never desert it. Overcome either by flattery or by fear. Let him not put light for darkness, nor darkness for light. Let him not call evil good, nor good evil. May he be a debtor to the wise and to the foolish, so that he may gather fruit from the progress of all. Grant to him, O Lord, an Episcopal chair for ruling thy church and the people committed to him. Be his authority, be his power, be his strength. Multiply upon him thy blessing, thy grace, so that thy gift may be fitted for always obtaining thy mercy. And by thy grace, may he be faithful. All right. So how wonderful to have the, uh, this ceremony for elevating an individual from one rank to the next level of spiritual um, efficacy and power and authority be full of the words of virtue. Many of the words in that prayer would be totally appropriate for uh, a candidate going from, uh, if in the case, mind you, let's see, I'm going to refer us back to the 10th stage. What it said in the 10th stage was, as in the world, a wheel-turning monarch, a chakravartin, ascends and gets anointed at the crown. So too now the bodhisattva is being elevated to the stage of Dharma prince, a 10th stage bodhisattva ready to become a Buddha in the next stage, the appointment to the rank, right? The elevation to the stage as we, we bounce back and forth in our translation. In the Catholic liturgy, this was the, those are the words, the prayer of the anointer of the crown to the, for the, the well-being of the candidate going up, right? Who is being anointed. And what I liked about that was the um, human qualities of humility, avoiding pride, of the ability to because of the new authority, the ability to feed others, right? The ability to be a refuge for others. That's uh, <coughs> kind of a servant king. In this case, it was the Catholic ceremony, but you can easily see how the bodhisattva fits in to that role, right? He is a servant leader. Uh, he leads by going below to the, uh, the need to satisfy the needs of his community, of his flock, right? The shepherd who takes the sheep safely across the wilderness to their new home. All right, so let's take a look now at our text once again. Through successive cultivation, he gathers good deeds, collecting the blessings and wisdom of the ninth stage, seeking the supreme dharma of the Buddhas, the water of Buddha's knowledge, anoints the crown of his head. All right, so the, um, there's a point that I want to make at this stage of it, which is in, uh, in all of the illustrations that we saw, right? We saw... Russia, we saw Germany, we saw France, we saw Egypt, we saw uh, some, uh, let's, let's assume, let's take, it might have been 
ancient Iraq, right? Babylon, which was just, just a center of culture and learning and knowledge. Um, never mind the you know 20th century geopolitical struggles. There's no doubt that uh, Babylon was in Sumeria was the center of of culture. Then we've seen that culture depicted. And in every case, there's something special about this part of the body and priests or authority figures who are taking a candidate up to the next level puts water or oil. They describe it as sometimes uh, oil mixed with spices, you know, something very pleasant or fragrances, puts that on the crown of the head to symbolize externally that this individual has now qualified for the next step, right? As they say, anointing the crown, the second verse says, accepting an appointment. You could say being promoted to the next rank, if you think military, right? If you were talking about uh, school, you get, you graduate, graduate to the next class, the next grade in school. Um, uh, this just occurred to me. Um, if you think about our typical school graduation, particularly when it, we get go from it's typically college, but I guess kin, uh, high schools too, we have a mortar board. You know, that's that graduation hat. the How do you say? Yeah. You you sure? Okay, there we go. Why, why do we take the tassel and take it from one side to the other, right? That's the uh, indicating, and you never get it straight. Which side is which? You always have to, which side am I supposed to, you know? Could it be that that hat, the graduation hat, our mortarboard, has some echo in anointing the crown of the head? Who knows? There's some something to do with this, this part of the anatomy. All right. What I want to share is there is a Buddhist phase uh, of meditative practice that is shared with the Taoists in China. And I have no, again, I probably have to go ask Danny Matt, Professor Matt, about any ancient Jewish uh, mysticism counterpart whereby in meditation, one connects the meridians from the back with the meridians in the front and the ren mai and the du mai, they talk about it, connect. And the anointing of the crown is not external, it is internal. And they describe the, uh, the esoteric, you could say yogic texts about advanced stages in meditation, they talk about sweet dew, uh, swallowing down into the dantian, you know. And this is, this is above my pay grade to be able to experience. But when they, they talk about it in advanced Buddhist meditation texts and the Taoists share it as well, they, they say this is an actual inner experience, not external. Could it be that this is not a possession of Buddhists or Taoists. This is an, a bit of knowledge from the earliest dawn of human experience. And the external anointing of the crown was an attempt to symbolize or to remember this deeper internal merging of, of this emergence of wisdom. Could be something like that. Like as, as, as I say, it's out of my pay grade. They, um, when I was a sprout back in the, the days of the summer of love in San Francisco in the 60s, right? They talked about Kundalini yoga as being something that you could play around with. Oh, cool, man. You just go off the top of your head, you know, it's groovy. 
and in term, in, in fact, uh, without a foundation and preparation for those actual internal physical changes that happened with the, these kinds of yoga, people went astray by and large. I never heard of anybody coming back once they went off the top of their head, you know, cool, fly around the Golden Gate Bridge, man, get really high, you know, and uh, irresponsible teaching without a tradition and without the appropriate safeguards and preparation and knowledge that you need to actually negotiate these uh, genuine uh, changes that uh, the Buddhists and the Taoists teach in a system responsibly, you can get in trouble, right? However, nonetheless, there, the, those teachings of Kundalini, when it was just cool, you know, or groovy, it's pointing to ancient traditional knowledge, traditional lore that is deep, deep in the human experience. Clearly, uh, all of those cultures left illustrations of an attempt by the, uh, the elect, the elite in every culture, with maybe the exception, what was this one? Um, did I, let's see, I went, uh, so maybe I can still find my photos here, hold on. Anointing the head fire. There we go. Okay, here's what I'm looking for. The um, this is a fascinating one. Not that one. Not the Janes, but and not Samuel and David. Uh, was it this one? There we are. This is fascinating because in the culture depicted here, which I I don't I can't identify. I don't know the source of this photo. But apparently, in cultures in the Middle East, even guests are greeted by a, some, some sense of anointing the crown of the head. And if you, you receive that reception from a host, you are indeed, indeed, a valued guest. I'm not sure why someone is in tears down below, but... Uh, there's a story involved there for sure. So anyway, there we are. Now, um, let's catch up to it. There is this practice in Ayurveda, in Indian medicine, whereby pancha karma is one of the methods of one of the therapies used to return someone to health. Panchakarma in Ayurveda, the Indian system of traditional holistic medicine, takes oil and uh, warms it up. I'm going to sneeze here, excuse me. And puts it on... <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Panchakarma is a healing technique whereby the person, the patient undergoing the procedure gets oil dripped on various parts of the head. And it's a profound, um, precise methodology. What kind of oil, how often it's applied, how long it's applied, what you do uh, when you're receiving panchakarma. But it's, um, they, it's a treatment given to people who feel as if their uh, energies are scattered for their essential uh, spirit and remarkable, miraculous uh, cures are not miraculous, remarkable, uh, wonderful, uh, efficacious healings are, are standard in people who receive panchakarma. Sometimes when people are possessed by spirits or by unfelicitous states of being, right? People get their spirits totally disarrayed. Panchakarma is a way to keep the spirits in and keep the ghosts out. Um, messiah in Christianity, the word Messiah 
can mean the one who has been anointed, the one whose brow has been anointed with oil. So the Christ, right? Um, chrism is the, the word for the actual substance used, the oil or the water. Hindus and Jains do it daily, uh, milk with milk from a sacred cow. So, goodness, there is so much to learn about this cultural ritual, which pops up right here in the Avatamsaka Sutra. <laughs> okay, we, uh, we covered the ground there. Um, what's going on? What's this about? How interesting that uh, our 10th stage Bodhisattva is not yet a Buddha, but he's on his way. And the sutra back in our, when it was the text, the prose said, just the way the uh, wheel turning monarch, the Chakravartin, of which the, the if, we, if we look at Buddhist cosmology, right? How the Buddhists talk about the heavens and the, and the earth and the hills as well. Right above humanity is a level of heaven called the Su Tian Wang Tian, the heaven where there are four divine kings. There are four devas. That's supposed to be the closest heaven. And we whose eyes don't open to see these things can't see them. But if you have your Tian Yan, your deva eye open, there they are. And they interact, you know. Uh, who else talks about this? Greeks. Get out your Edith Hamilton. Everybody, Edith Hamilton's Greek mythology and Roman mythology. She is the author whose stories of uh, the gods in the Greek and Hellenistic Roman pantheon. She, uh, Edith Hamilton has the most published uh, accounts of those stories. Um, those are the devas on Mount Olympus, who in the Buddhist cosmology are in the heaven of the four kings. Are they the same? Mm. Don't dare say that, but look it up. Do the research. Find out what's different. Surely the Asuras are extremely similar to the Titans, and they're warring with the gods. Yeah, yeah. Happens in the Indian pantheon happens in the Greek pantheon. And since they're neighbors, are we talking about the same thing? Hmm, interesting to look into. So there among the heavens, the devas of the four heavens, the Si Da Tian Wang, the four heavenly kings, the four devas, celestial kings there, they are anointed on the crown. The same way it happens with them, it's happening to our bodhisattva. How about that? Okay, next, next. The Bodhisattva acquires samadhis beyond numbering, skillfully discerns the function of each one. The final samadhi is called accepting the appointment. Abiding in this vast state, he rests unshakable. Our Bodhisattva there is not moving. He's now purified his mind with these samadhis. And here's, here's what I understand about these. First of all, that's a Sanskrit word, isn't it? Samadhi, sanme in Chinese. As Buddhism comes to the West, we encounter these words, Buddha, right? The awakened person, the awakened human, the awakened one. Bodhisattva, the awakened, awakening, the awakened being who awakens others, right? Dharma, small d means phenomena, events in, in physics, event, dharma. Big D, large D, capital D-A-R-D-A-H-R-M-A. D-H-A-R-M-A, means teachings, words the Buddha spoke. Interestingly, 
uh, early translators translated as law. If you read the old, the early 19th, 20th century translations of Buddhist texts, they say, ah, the Buddha's law, right? Well, that's problematic because it's, you know, law, there's laws of physics, there's federal law, there's election law, there's tort law, there's litigation, right? Court of law. So don't go there, Com confusing. As these words come into the West, we need to get a correct, accurate rendition if we're going to be talking about Buddhist practice, things the Buddha left behind for us to pick up and use and make our own. These are not the possession of Buddhist ink, right? Of dharma.com. Nobody owns the dharma. And for that reason, it can be distorted and made into something it never was, never meant to be. So we want to prevent that, avoid that. We want to make it something that we can approach and use and ultimately master and incorporate and be transformed by, be liberated by, so we can pass it on to others, right? That's, that's the job. And interestingly, how the Buddha, the prince under the Bodhi tree had his enlightenment experience and said, uh-uh. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm going. Why? Nobody's going to understand it. It's too difficult. It's too people go the opposite way. In Chinese, we say, we turn our backs on enlightenment and run off into the, the dust of our senses. At that moment, the devas from the Brahma heaven came down and said, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't forget. Don't forget your vows. Living beings are suffering like mad. They're upside down. They're confused. You've got to teach. You've got to try. You have to turn the Dharma wheel. You have to turn the wheel of the law, right? Wrong. Not the law of the, the Dharma. So he said, okay, talk me into it. But he walked around the Bodhi tree. They stayed for weeks before he finally got up the resolution to indeed follow his vows and try to teach us. He explained the Avatamsaka Sutra. He explained it right here. This text we're on and then set off to, to distill that down to where people could actually absorb it. One of the things that he despaired of teaching because it can't be taught in words is samadhi right here. Samadhi is what happens to my mind, your mind, our human minds, when we apply the cookie cutter mold, M-O-U-L-D, the, the imprint of the Dharma, Dharma practices. If we xing, if we cultivate the way, if we invoke these methods and techniques, the human body and the mind and the spirit and the nature transform in marvelous ways. And at a certain point, samadhi happens. You can't talk about samadhi with any authority, but anybody can embody it, can make it happen, can experience it, right? So, okay. Why am I going round the barn like this? It's to say what happens next in the 10th stage to the Bodhisattva is all these samadhis arise from his or her mind naturally, organically, without any other effort. And he knows how to use each one to teach and to keep the planet turning on its axis and to keep living beings from destroying each other, right? And to take us into enlightenment, to awakening. He gets the last one, which is called accepting the appointment. This, and the symbol of that is the anointing on the crown. And once he gets there, he doesn't move any further. He's now a 10th stage 
Bodhisattva. All right, so far so good. Um, the, um, we're gonna go into the lotus flower <laughs> next and all the stuff that happens, the, the, the cinematic stuff, just like a movie, like Tinkerbell circling the magic palace in any Disney film. Tinkerbell, all the magic from the palace, the happiest place on earth, Disneyland, right? Similarly next week, I won't break it, I won't destroy it for you. Coming up next week. But let me talk about one of the Buddha's samadhis that happens. And it's called the Hai Yin San Mei, the ocean imprint, the ocean seal. We say an ocean seal, you think of a California sea lion, right? Ork, ork, ork. Not that kind of ocean seal. Seal meaning like a stamp, like a chop, right? Ocean seal. In this samadhi, which arises out of the bodhisattva mind, everything is like an ocean, only there's no waves on the water. And in the ocean is the perfect imprint of every phenomena on the planet, including every person. And the Bodhisattva is able to see imprinted, right, in the ocean water, everything in totality, perfectly reflected there, and is able to understand and integrate and heal all of the things that appear in the ocean full of imprints. Hayin Sanme. It's said to be the source of the Avatamsaka Sutra. From that samadhi, he speaks the Avatamsaka and then all the others. <clears throat> it's when have you had a state of mind so clear and so perfect and so quiet and so, you know, pristine that you can from there see and explain everything? Everything is everything, right? Yeah, yeah. So, my goodness, that's one of those profound states of mind that begins where? It begins with the first thought. And I think I want to think it over again. I better check out whether I've got greed in my mind or anger or delusion. Was that dishonest? Was that a lie? Am I seeking? Am I going to like run outside looking for something that's never going to hit the spot because I've already got it, that I'm going to try to replace it with what I, right? That bit of reflection, that bit of self-investigation is the start that leads to meditation, calm, what they call qing an, clear, calm state, leading to chan ding, dhyana, first, second, third, fourth, leading to samadhi, to the eight kinds of samadhi, the four limitless samadhis, and on to nirvana, which is, can be with outflows, meaning incomplete, and then a nirvana beyond residue and remainder without outflows, all the way to the bodhisattvas, wonderful samadhis, the shrangama samadhi, the vairochanas, nature samadhi, right? The uh, avatamsaka ocean imprint samadhi. It's simply a progressive refinement of my mind right this minute, your mind right this minute, but we have to actually do it. So that's that word, san me, samadhi. Uh, maybe English will start to pick up on it. I don't know. With the rise of mind, mindfulness, people are going to start wondering, right? Mindfulness, depending on that practice, it's the practices that do it. So the more people join in a mindfulness class or group or practice at home in the bedroom, right? People are going to start discovering what arises from their minds when they are calm. Zheng ding, zheng shou, right focus and right reception. You're tuning in to your own, your own, what's the word? Your own 64 
what was the civil defense network? Your own network, that's the word I'm looking for. You're tuned into the right frequency, Jung Shou, right? And pretty soon you get the signal. Alrighty, so by golly, I said, we're going from the sublime, which is the 10th stage Bodhisattva. Here I am talking about these states that are so far out, my goodness. We're going from there to that early stage that we can share when we start to look at my mind indeed. And what do I do with my mind? Um, what is that? Look here, what have we got on the screen? We have a set of videos about diet. And I was aware, the, the thing that prompted me to bring this up today was the realization that if you, I'm gonna come out of this for a minute. Oh, if you take the word, give me a, where are my notes? I want my note, not that. I'll go down here, here we go, this'll do. If you take the word coronavirus, we'll make it bigger, bigger yet. And you do an anagram with it, you get the word carnivorous. Switch the letters. Coronavirus and carnivorous are related. How are they related? They're related through eating meat. No joke. So the, the jury is out about where the coronavirus came from and people are frantically pointing fingers and blaming, blaming. We don't know is the answer. We don't know whether it hopped from the animal realm to the human realm, whether it was created with ill intent in a lab in China, in the US, mutual accusations, doesn't matter. Uh, what we're saying now, we will at some point know where coronavirus came from. Currently, one of the main theories says it came from humans eating animals, somehow ingesting animals into our bodies, either through bat soup, either through eating pangolins or civet cats. That's the current theory. So these are videos that are available to you now, uh, many of us, maybe if you're listening from China, I don't know if these are available, but they're available, go out to the websites. Uh, I can particularly recommend Forks Over Knives because I know the men and women who put it together. Um, Game Changers has to do, let's see, Forks Over Knives gives us, uh, actual, takes us in the kitchen, shows us from doctor's point of view, uh, good foods to eat. Game Changers shows us the athletes and the people who have become vegan and how strong and successful they are in athletic competition. Bodybuilders, intense, long, ultra marathon runners, right? Cowspiracy was created by a couple, a friend of mine, two friends of mine, uh, friends of the Berkeley Monastery, uh, who went out to organizations that profess to be interested in environment, environmental awareness, and ask them about their diets and discovered that actually changing to a vegan, plant-based, harmless diet is threatening to many people and they will not actually commit to it themselves. Fascinating to discover. In fact, this, this kind-hearted, well-meaning couple who are documentarians went around and asked, I won't name the organizations, go take a look, go watch Conspiracy. They asked uh, the people who were promoting uh, eco ecological awareness, environmental awareness, who, when they were asked what they ate, changed the subject and made, got very uncomfortable because why? Couldn't stop eating meat. 
didn't want to talk about it. The next film that I want to share with everybody is currently available on Netflix. It's Sea Spiracy. It's the same setup. A documentarian couple goes out to look at what's happening now with the health of the oceans. And the same thing happens when they poke around and say, hey, how about eating plants instead of animals? They get death threats. And you think, how is that possible? Indeed, indeed, it is the case. So fascinating, fascinating stuff going on here with the uh, cutting edge of people who are trying to say, let's look into, let's look into the principles of harmless plant-based eating. Here's where the Buddhists come in. We have abundant material on the, the compassion side of why one might consider eating less meat. Have a kind heart. We have what's called Wuliang Datsu, infinite great kindness. We have what is called same body, great compassion, Tong Ti Da Be. The Buddhists have a contribution to make when it comes to the idea that pay attention to the spiritual side of living beings. They call it Wuyuan Datsu. Great kindness, even for strangers. Right? They say that kindness can give happiness. When you're kind, it's, it's easy to see ways to make people happy. When we're feeling the compassion and empathy, we're able to end suffering for others. And here are some of the most wonderful poems that have been part of the Mahayana, the Chinese Buddhist pantheon for a very long time in the literary side of things, right? What do we have here? We have a Tang Dynasty poet named Lu Fu Huang. He said, Wan feng hui rao yi feng shen, dao ci chang xiu ku xing xin, zi sao shui zhong gui lu ji, qian ming kong you, lie ran xun, lie ren xun. Right? What does he say? He says, around this lonely mountaintop, myriad peaks revolve. I've come to cultivate ascetics, disciplined resolve. I take my broom and sweep away the deer's tracks in the snow. The deer pass by, but in the morning, hunters will not know. Here he is, the compassionate hermit, right? Living out there in the mountains. What is he doing? He notices that the deer's tracks, the deer leaves tracks as he walks by and the hunters are gonna find him and shoot the deer. So he goes out with his broom, sweeps away the tracks. Right on, there you go, bud, right? This is kindness in action. Indeed, let's go down to, let's look at this one here. Oh, it's an abattoir. It's a slaughter yard, slaughterhouse, stockyard for pigs, <coughs> bacon, pork chops, ham, right? Look at the babies. The babies, three babies are looking at the pig who is being hauled and beaten away and they are crying for their mother This is Master Hongyi from the, the contemporary, from the Republican period. Sheng li chang ce ce, lin xing fu hui shao, si qu bu zai lai, nian er er zhi fao. Final goodbye. Taste the pain of parting from one's kin. She turns her head around before she goes. This time, she won't return again. Don't you wonder if her children know? Don't you wonder? This one I really like. 
let's uh, let's skip ahead and look at the the big picture. Here's the the dog, faithful gaze looking up at his master. The master has got this fifty foot stair, thousand foot stair in the fifty foot room, right? Looking off in the pondering, pondering. How does it go? It goes, Jie Ro Shi, from Huang Tingjian, who was a uh, prime minister in the Song Dynasty. Wo Ro, Zhong Sheng Ro, Ming Shu, Ti Bu Shu, Yuan Tong, Yi Zhong Xing, Zhi Shi Bie Xing Xu. My flesh and creature's flesh are different only in name. Although we come in many shapes, our nature is the same. Look at that. So good, huh? And here's that picture again. There he is. And yet, you know, Fido is our companion when they die too young, our hearts are broken. And yet, we eat other four-legged mammals without a thought. Seems funny. This one, this one is the last one I want to share today. This is really, really powerful. And there's a principle involved here. Let's look at the picture first. That is controversial, to say the least. And yet for folks who see the connection, it's not controversial at all, which is what? Look in the center, the pig that we saw leaving her children is now on its way to becoming pork chops. The butchers have cut its throat, it's lying in a pool of blood, they're gutting it, taking out the intestines, and they're gonna skin it, turn it into bacon and ham. And around this scene, from the slaughterhouse is a battlefield. And the illustrator has depicted a Chinese war scene, right? But it could be Iraq, it could be Vietnam, it could be civil war, it could be Waterloo, it could be St. Petersburg, anywhere where humans try hard to kill each other. The verse is from the Tang Dynasty, from a monk whose name was Cloud of Vows, Chan Monk. Qian ba nian lai wan li gong, yuan shen si hai hen nan ping, yu zhi shi shang dao bing jie, qie wen du men ye ban sheng. For countless years, the bitter stew of hate goes boiling on. Its vengeful broth is ocean deep, impossible to calm. To learn the cause of so much conflict. So why is it controversial? Uh, I've told the story when I lived in Calgary at, at Avatomska Monastery, we were in a part of the neighborhood, an old neighborhood in Calgary called Ramsey, where our monastery was a uh, former mom and pop grocery store on the corner. Red brick. And it was a place where you came for a bottle of milk and a loaf of bread, you know, in, in the afternoon. And, and uh, behind us was the railroad track. We were the last street before the railroad. And on the other side of the railroad track was a slaughterhouse. We were in the part of Calgary where the cows came in. The train that let the cows, that the, was the the slaughterhouse train, the stockyard train, would always come at night and it would stop and you could hear the hooves crossing off the cattle car, dun, 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 across the wooden gangplank into the stockyard. And you could hear the sounds. They were not happy. And the energy, the vibes of that slaughterhouse late at night were just awful. And we'd be meditating and you could, without even hearing, knowing what time it was or hearing the sound, you knew that 
another shipment of cows on their way to die had arrived at the slaughterhouse. It was awful because there was hate and fear and terror. And it took no stretch of the imagination to see that when this is loosed into the world, it doesn't just evaporate. It's out there. This cows are extremely sentient. They weigh 1,600 pounds and their, their hearts are big and they're beating and they're, they love their children and their, their skins are as sensitive as my skin, you know. So their eyes are huge. Cow's eyes are just big brown eyes. And when you turn that into food, there is a resentment that doesn't dissipate with the wind. So this picture came alive for me when I lived in Calgary by the slaughterhouse. It was so clear that one cause leads to the other effect. When that much hate, but hatred and resentment boils over, people who come back to settle their debts and wars are caused. To learn the cause of all this conflict, terror, hate, and war, listen to the cries at midnight by the butcher's door. Right? And mind you, my grandpa was a butcher in Sherbrooke, Quebec. By golly, he was indeed. So this is not far from my own, uh, I don't know, this, the sins of the father. Don't know if that's, I'm repaying some of that karma. I don't know. Don't know. But I would be willing to, to lighten the karmic burden on my grandpa. So that's it for today. Oh, no, 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 no. I take it back. Got another story before we get to the announcements. Great story, courtesy of Dharma Master Hung Chur. Thank you, Dharma Master Chur, for telling me about the hero rat who is retiring from his job detecting landmines. This is a BBC story recently. Here he is with his gold medal around his neck. His name is Magawa. He is slowing down in his old age, but this is a African, uh, called a giant rat. What's he called? He's a, uh, let's see here. Does it say what kind? Uh, yeah, an uh, African giant rat. He weighs two, two pounds. And he has detected 70 plus landmines. And they gave him a gold medal, rat sized, and he's wearing it with distinction, proudly. Um, he is retiring now. He's did it for five years, sniffed out 71 landmines and dozen more unexploded items in Cambodia. His handler, Malin, whose picture shows up down below, says he's slowing down. She wants to respect his needs. In Cambodia, there are six million landmines set sewn on the ground, waiting to explode. And a Belgian registered charity called Apopo, based in Tanzania, is raising hero rats to detect landmines since the 90s. They are certified after a year of training. A bunch of new rats has been assessed by the Cambodian Mine Action Center, Passive Flying Colors. Here she is. Here's the trainer. She's got her rat. And nothing is said about her, but talk about a hero devoting her life to removing landmines. The uh, older rat will stay in post to mentor the new recruits, but his performance, 71 landmines, is unbeaten. She's proud to work side by side. He's small, but he's saved many lives, allowing us to return much needed safe land back to our people as quickly and cost effectively as possible. Now, how does it work? He weighs 2.6 kilo uh, pounds, 1.2 kilograms. He's 28 inches long, 70 centimeters. That's bigger than other rat species, but it's still light enough. It can walk over a landmine and not set it off. The rats are trained to detect a chemical compound within the explosives. They ignore the metal. They can search for mines more quickly. Once they find the explosive, they scratch the top to alert their human co-workers, <laughs> not owners, not trainers, but the co-worker the human. He can look over a field the size of a tennis court in 20 minutes, something that would take a person with a metal detector between one and four days. So thank you to the trainer Malin and to the rat hero Magawa, who is now retiring after five years on the job. Let us give him a roundly hallelujah, bodhisvaha. Thank you, kind sir.
Yeah, indeed, we're doing that. Man, oh man, heroic rats. Let's go out to the Berkeley Monastery website and ask Jinchuan or Jinwei Shi to give us some information about what's happening. What's the news? Okay, well, I realize our website is a little bit outdated, but if you scroll down, um, let's see, we have our Fridays. Oh, oh, that was a waking call. Actually, we should mention that. The waking call is now on, online. If people missed it, if you go to the RSVP, I think you will go to the service space website and uh, find a recording of Rung Shur's interview with Nipun. And it's a very interesting call. It goes over Rung Shur's uh, experience as a and his youth, then meeting Master Hua, and then um, bowing on the pilgrimage, a little bit about the Bodhisattva path. So if people are interested, please go there. And keep going down. We have Noble Friendship Pa, which starts tomorrow. And so if you would like to sign up, now is the last chance. Um, and then we'll begin our orientation call tomorrow morning. And the other one we have is we're still doing our bowing for India and all the uh, countries affected by COVID um, on Friday morning. So we have to update that, that link. But June 11th will be our next one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Otherwise, our regular programs are in effect. Okay. Berkeley Monks Online. Berkeley Monastery Online. And also DRBU is still receiving applications. So... You're interested. Right. I wanted to show everyone Dharma Realm Buddhist University. You can find it from the Berkeley Monastery website, but when you click on that, it takes you out to our DRBU website, which is a jumping website. Let's see here. DRBU. Oh, I need to go no, back. It clicked, it clicked to the actual, you click it again. Click it again. No, no, not the link, but the, um, is, there a, is there no link there? Oh, like no. So that goes to the to the actual item on the website. Huh, okay, maybe so I'm going to go out. I'll do it myself here. drbu.edu. Here we are. This is drbu website. You can still apply for fall 2021, but do it quickly. Wonderful website, wonderful university. Okay, here's online community classes. This one over here is what we're currently in, investigating right now. Here's admissions, uh, certificate and translation. There's a blog, lots of stuff to discover on DRBU website. What is your future with Dharma Realm Buddhist University? Find out. Okay, thank you so much for the report and for the news. Um, we are still using Medicine Buddha's mantra as our transference, our preferred transference vehicle, but dedicating merit is up to you. It's interactive. We do it together and uh, you do it with a wish. So please make a wish, send out your wish for well-being to whomever you would like to share your merit and virtue with. Om Namo Bhagavate Paisajya Guru Durya Prabharajaya Atagataya Arahate Samyak Sambudaya Padyata Om Paisaje Paisaje Paisaja Samudgate Swaha I Sajya Guru I Durya Prabharajaya Atagataya Arha 
Mate Samyak Sambudaya Tadyata Om Asaje Asaje Asaja Samudate Swaha Om Namo Madhuate Asaja Guru Vajurya Prabharaja Sincerity wins the day. So here is Guan Yin Bodhisattva. We can look at Guan Yin as we bow to the Buddhas three times. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you all next week. Omitofo.